No Box Dance presents Dance Behind the Screen, Process Production and Social Media. Don't forget, say no to the box. Dile no a la caja, cuyo un gran yomira en San Jaiza pasa de hell. Welcome back to Dance Behind the Screen podcast. This is your host, Mark Thea. In season six, our theme is dance and technology. Our goal this season is to talk about how dance can coexist in a world of screens, social media, and interactive and immersive environments. Today's guest you might recognize from the Novox Dance Film Festival 2023 jury panel. He is an award-winning filmmaker, educator, and the director and founder of the Dallas Video Fest. Bart Weiss, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. You've done an incredible job with the festival. And I think dance and film is just a really great marriage. And it's so great, the work that you've done. Thank you, Bart. I know my team and I will appreciate your sentiment. When I was thinking about how I wanted to start off our conversation and have our audience just get to know you a little bit before we start to uncover your path and wealth of knowledge related to dance and film, I thought what better way than finding out a film that best represents your worldview. If you had to pick a film that describes your view of the world, what would it be? I I was thinking about this, I should let the audience know that I got this question in advance, but I still have <laughs> not come up with a really great film. My life is so diverse and different in so many ways. But the film I kept coming back to was Fellini's Eight and a Half, which is a film about a director and all the sort of craziness. And it's both interesting in terms of its story, but also the way the story is told. It's very experimental for a narrative film and it really gives some insight into what a filmmaker does and thinks about yet is very expressionistic you are listening to now box dance your history and journey with film is quite extensive and your impact on the industry is extremely inspiring as i shared with you before the interview your encouragement for No Box Dance Film Festival is really meaningful to me and my team. I would love for our audience, if they don't know you already, to just get to know you a little bit better. Could you briefly introduce yourself and talk about your relationship with the film industry? And perhaps you can start by maybe sharing your experiences making dance film and how it led you to where you are. My love for film started when I was in college. And then my first three semesters, I had a different major every semester. It's like, I like politics and so maybe political science is good. And then sociology. And then I took uh, a couple of film classes, three film classes, actually. And I distinctly remember one night when I was editing a project and I stayed up all night editing it with real joy. And all the other work I was doing in college was like difficult because I'm not a very disciplined writer. Writing is very difficult for me. But there was something very magical about editing film. And I realized that there was something I liked there. And then so I, I was at this small college in Wisconsin, and I had taken all of the film classes they had there that one semester. So I transferred um, to Temple University in Philadelphia. Um, where I grew up and which was cheaper. They had a really good film program and I learned a lot about, about filming uh, there in a much deeper way. But the thing that was interesting was that the, the aesthetic, like every film program has a kind of aesthetic attached to it. The aesthetic of the cl- of the place where I was in Wisconsin, Beloit was very much about experimental filmmaking. I was really into experimental filmmaking the book Expanded Cinema was like really important to me. And I was really pleased that later as I did the festival, the the author of that book, Gene Youngblood, actually came to my festival and spoke, which was very meaningful to me. And then I went to Temple, which was very much of a documentary program. And then later on, when I went to graduate school, I went to Columbia, which has a very much of a narrative program. So in each of the places I went, I learned a different kind of universe of filmmaking, and which is why I can speak 
and do each of them in different kind of ways. Although I would say probably my passion is greater for documentary these days. But what was really interesting, like was at Temple and I was making films that the previous work was all very experimental. And to make the transition from working with actual people and, and in the frame and not necessarily working with dialogue, but using the kind of visual beauty and experimenting with form that I was doing in the experimental films and then mixing that with the 60 millimeter camera and having a person in there that that working in dance was really a good thing. And also my girlfriend at the time, her sister was a dancer. So I knew somebody who could could do well. And I made this film that called Floating Encore, which was a, a dance film. And I, I brought this dancer into like many different environments. We were shooting dance in a subway in Philadelphia and then eventually on a stage and put the image on a television and kind of just play with it in different ways. And that film got shown in festivals. And that was like in a sort of mid-level, level class and nobody had ever even submitted a film in that level class before. So that actually got shown in festivals was a big deal. And then I did several more films, both experimenting with all of them working with dance and kind of doing some sense. I was also very interested in um, the sense of repetition, a kind of Philip Glass kind of way of working with music, but trying to work with that in dance by having a similar gesture repeated over time, but using filters and different ways of subtly changing it. And then I had a few other kinds of projects that I did. My background with dance film was really as a transitional device, to then help me know how to direct somebody and to get what I wanted. And that was very important. And then I made documentaries and then I made narrative films and I've done some dance work later. I love to hear that, Barn. I, I guess I didn't even realize your beginnings with dance film. And I think that's really special. What kind of advice do you have for makers whether it's dance specific or just filmmakers in general. It's a matter of thinking about movement in space, thinking about the frame. And if you just imagine a vector, so a movement is a vector, so it's going this way, it's going that way. And just imagine what it is in the symphony of movement that works for you, right? So there should be a kind of language that you're thinking about and, and a methodology. So I'm doing a sequence where we're doing this, but we're slightly changing the angle as we're doing this. Just think of the screen in two dimensions, not three dimensions, three dimensions you think of in the next step, but just where is that sense of left up down and what is the kind of movement you're trying to think about in terms of that. And in your experience, Reviewing the films for the No Box Dance Film Festival, what do you think were the elements of a successful dance film? Don't forget to say no to the box. Okay, so first, the first thing I have to say is I've been blown away at the incredible work in the last, say, two years in dance film. I certainly is something I've been aware of for a long time, but the both the production value has increased. And I believe that there is this real sense of the people who are were making these films. And, and in the past, there were either people who were dancers who really knew dance and were just doing something in front of the camera, or filmmakers who know a little bit about dance. But now we have people that are deeply skilled in both. And that there is this artistic vision that combines them seamlessly, where there isn't one that's weaker than the other. It's, this is a nice film that has great dance in it, or this is great dance of a uh, mediocre filmmaking. And I think this comes from years and years of people seeing this. And dance film goes way back, and particularly in video, the 
in the early days of the Judson Theater in New York, where all these experimental musicians and artists and dancers were were doing all this work, that there was a lot of people making these these videos, which were mostly recording a performance, but at least that the, there is a tradition that goes back quite a long way. And there are experimental filmmakers like Ed M. Schwiller, who made a bunch of experimental films that dealt with dance. There is a strong history here that, uh, that's been around for quite a long. And now, uh, instead of it just being a novel idea that we can do something interesting, it's a mature language that people can work with. The question really comes in the judging, and this is a very difficult thing, is what do you value? Like, and because in some of them, there's like an interesting story, or there's a different interesting visual element, or there's this food thing that's going on that's really fascinating. It takes the whole idea of what a performance is and turns it on its head in a sense. And as you're judging something, that on the other side of that, there was the filmmaker that like hopes that they get in the festival and get shown at the festival and they win something. And the judgments that are made are like, it's they're all good, but I know that when you reject something that changes somebody's life for the worst and you accept it, it changes them for the better. But at the same time, it's it's not listed just so much better than everything else. It's this is interesting in a different kind of way. And so the things that I'm always looking for are ways in which you've done things that people haven't done them before and trying to find some sense of innovation in in the project that that hasn't been done and there every time there's some things that are just like never thought anybody would do that and it's really fascinating i think our value systems as a festival definitely aligned with your value system part of the mission of the nova Science film festival is to find and curate films that are challenging the possibilities of dance in the video form. And I think another example, you talked about this kind of transition from being um, a novelty to a more mature expression of ideas in the field of dance film. And another field that is emerging that you have experience in is the field of mobile filmmaking. And this is something that's very interesting to us at Nobox because of our interest in dance and kind of the digital realm. I'm Mm. wondering how you're thinking about mobile filmmaking. Nowadays, everyone essentially is a filmmaker. We have our mobile devices or a tablet, something like that. And so whether we're intentionally creating a creative film for sharing with an audience, or we're just capturing maybe a birthday party or date night or something like that, and then uploading it to our TikTok or Instagram, we're sharing it with an audience, whether we're realizing it or not, whether we're storyboarding or not. In your experience teaching many workshops about mobile filmmaking, can you give us a mini lesson about how you think about mobile filmmaking and what we should be doing and what we should avoid? The first thing you need to think about it, there's a difference between sort of capturing images for posterity, like shooting my cats or walking down the street and something looks interesting and shooting with intention. And so if you're making a dance film, you are not just simply capturing what's in front of you. The idea is how do I want to shape this? What am I saying about this movement? Where would be the best place to put the cameras? Once you start to look at the screen and say, what do I want to do here? Then it becomes a very different prospect. So it comes with a sense of intention. And I think that separates the, I'm just recording a birthday party where you, where the camera is just a passive tool to capture what's there to an active tool, right? I want to be over here because that's going to make the shot that looks this way and will have this kind of effect. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, what are you shooting with? If you're shooting with just the camera, the app that comes with the phone, 
that can only take you so far. There's this wonderful application that at this point is only available for iOS phones, but it's free and it's called the Black Magic Camera App. And the Black Magic Camera App gives you all of the qualities that a professional camera has. The Black Camera App is done by made by DaVinci Black Magic is the company and they make this like $6,000 camera and the interface on the phone looks exactly like that. So you can control exposure and focus and you can really have a lot of control and that makes a lot of difference. But the other thing is aside from just having the phone, what can you do to make it work better? So there are some sound things that we can do, but for dance film, sound isn't recording. Live sound isn't as important as being able to move the phone. Holding my phone here and trying to hold it still, I can do that, but it's not so easy. Although I must say that if I'm working with a dancer, being able to dance with a phone can be really useful, right? It's a lot smaller than a big camera, but it's still an awkward thing to hold. So there, there are several things. There's like a handle you could use to hold it a little bit better, or I've got a selfie stick. I've got a bunch of them actually. Each of them is slightly different than the other that you can use just to hold it still. But the other thing that is really great to use for dance film is a gimbal. A gimbal is just something that allows you to move well with the camera and it, it gives you, it makes it look like you have a dolly, but it's just this little thing. And some of them cost like, there's some that cost $200 and some that cost like $150. DJI is a company that makes some and there's some other companies that make them as well. So if you're doing a dance film, like having something like one of these gimbals will let you really get some good movement from the camera and have it do work really smoothly. And if you don't have a gimbal, there are on all of the phones, there are, are ways to reduce the shake in there and the settings. But if you do that, you have to have a good amount of light. So if you're in a low light situation, those action mode or things that reduce that level of shake are not going to work very well for you. Uh, uh, see, my watch has opinions about some of the things that I say. It's really funny in class. I'll be talking about something and then my watch will be listening and make a comment about that. Mostly it says, I don't understand that. <laughs> but it's can, a, can yeah. you elaborate on some things that should be avoided when creating films with mobile devices? The biggest challenge people have is with sound. And so if your characters are going to be speaking, it's a real problem because the distance when you're recording synchronous sound, the distance between the where it comes from your lips and where it's recorded are very critical. In traditional motion picture work, you would have a lavalier on somebody and or a boom pole with the mic. So most of the time when we're shooting with mobile, it's just like one person, right? You don't come there with the crew. So you don't have a sound person to do that. There are, there's this whole universe of gear that, that are small lavaliers that connect to a little box that you can put directly into your phone so that you can get good sound. So sound is the biggest um, problem um, to work with. And then there's, okay, so I shot it. What do I do with it? And it's very easy to take material from a phone, bring it on your computer, and then um, choose how you can edit with. And the quality of the image, uh, particularly on the latest iPhone, is truly astounding. You can shoot in what's known as ProRes. You can shoot with Log and LUT, which means that you can get more dynamic range within the image. And these are things that used to be available only on very expensive cameras, and now they are clearly available on the phone. There are some limitations. For example, on all phones, phone cameras, there is only one f-stop. When you shoot with a film camera or a video camera, there is something in the camera that changes the size of 
the hole that allows light in, right? So we only have one f-stop. So when you want to change exposure, what you're really doing is a changing the what's known as the ISO, which is basically the sensitivity to the chip in the phone, right? But the thing is, when you're in lower light and you up the ISO and get more sensitivity, then you get a little bit more grain. So since you don't have control over exposure, sometimes you can do things to trick it into exposing things differently. For example, you can place in front of the camera what's known as a neutral density filter or ND filter. And a neutral density filter is like putting sunglasses in front of the lens. It's just color neutral, but it is, has a level of grayness. So less light comes in to the lens. So particularly, let's say if you're shooting in a bright, sunny day and you look at the viewfinder and it's, oh, it's way overexposed, right? So I put a neutral density filter on it and it will reduce what the light is coming in. So while it can change the size of the f-stop, it can change the light that's coming into it in a different kind of way. So that's an example of ways in which we can use some of these add-ons um, to work. One of the other things to think about if you're shooting with mobile is sometimes when you buy a new phone, one of the things you think about is like, how much hard drive space do I need? And the way they market these things is if I want a lot of hard drive space, it's going to cost a lot more money. So most people don't get very much hard drive space. So then you're in the situation of my phone is filling up. So I've got to dump off my footage. I shoot a little bit, dump it off. So with the latest iPhone, they have the ability to have a hard drive. Okay. This is a four terabyte hard drive. So that means I can connect this to my phone and I can shoot all day long and not have to worry about that, which is pretty amazing, right? That's really tiny. So I can, so like I said, I have a lot of things and I'm writing this book, so it's tax deductible, but I've been spending a lot of money on these accessories, but it makes shooting a lot easier. And the more you get into it, the more you try different things. And unlike other things, this world is changing so quickly. So something you buy today will be outdated six months from now, but that's the world we live in. But the other thing about shooting, uh, just very quickly with the phone, two, two things that are really important. One is because it's just you and you don't need a crew, the level of intimacy you can have with your dancer is different, right? I don't have a gaffer and a grip and a sound person and a whole bunch of other people around, just you and me, right? So let's try something. Let's do something over here. Let's do something. So it enables what you can get in front of the camera a lot differently. Okay. And the other thing is that it takes there are a lot of people listening to us right now who are saying, I wanted to do something. And then say, I don't have enough money to do this. If you do, there's no reason not to make that film. That idea you have, your excuse for not doing it is gone because you have the phone in your hand and you can make it for whatever you have. And so go and do it. Bart, I want to shift gears a little bit here. And as the director of Dallas Video Fest and producer of Frame of Mind for KERA TV, I'm sure that your experience watching so many films is very expansive. And I'm curious, what do you think the trends are for filmmaking in 2024? It's really hard to get a sense of trends there's in many ways there's a lot of influence of the sort of twitch economy of certainly tiktok has had a great influence on things but filmmaking in general is very strong stronger than it's been a long time we had a difficult time going through the pandemic 
And then there was the difficult time of going through the, the writers and actors strikes, but we are on the other side of both of those. And with Oppenheimer and Barbie, the film business is become, becoming stronger. So there's Hollywood's doing well, films are being made, although the Hollywood companies are all struggling because this is it's crazy. During the pandemic, all these streaming services were critical to our sanity, right? Every week there was like another series on something and that was interesting and we were stuck at home and that was really critical. And now all the streamers are struggling because they are not, the economic model is not working in the same way. So people are dropping services. There aren't as many new and interesting things showing up. So there's, and consumers don't want to pay more. You can start to see that advertising has start to come into play to help a little bit. We're in a sense of transition for models. Movie theaters are not doing bad, but they're not doing great. So when they have a big hit like Oppenheimer and Barbie, people will be there. And I think that because the Oscars are coming up soon, people will be going to movie theaters in a little bit. And by the way, as we're recording this, one of the things that's really great, the, my favorite thing about the Oscars is that there are these programs called the Oscar nominated shorts, and they're documentaries, live action and animated films, and they are all magnificent. And I would strongly recommend going to see any of those programs. They are just, it's just really wonderful to see. And it's very rare that people go out and see short films. Short films are, aside from festivals, they're hard to, to see. And these are really quite good. Taking that question from a completely different direction, because of mobile filmmaking, there are more voices that are heard and more people can tell stories. One of the things that I, uh, I write about in the book is the democratization of media. There's always been like the expensive equipment, 35 millimeter film. And so after there's 35 millimeter film, then there's 16 millimeter film there for people to take home movies. And then when professionals use 16, then there's like super eight and eight millimeter and all these other things. So whenever there's these ex big expensive things, there are these smaller things, right? And this happens in film, it happens in video, it happens in all media, but the phone is like the best example of democratization of media because everybody has one, right? And so anybody from any community can make a film. One of the things that people talk about is extracted storytelling. I don't know if you've heard that term. For example, if you were to live in New York and then move to or, or go to West Virginia and make a film about coal miners, your perspective on coal miners is not the same as if somebody in West Virginia was making the film about coal miners, right? So there has been this tradition of people going someplace and filming something through the eyes of where they come from. And with phones, people who are in that tradition. So if you are, if you are in a tribe that has a certain unique dance that you do and you film, that's going to look different than me coming and filming that dance. Right. So the phones allow for a completely different kind of community of people to make that work. Create, discuss, and advocate for art. No box dance. How do you say no to the box? That's our tagline here. Yeah. I have said no to the box for a long time. To really say no to the box, you have to have confidence that what you want to do is worthwhile. Because a lot of people are thinking about doing something in the box and then they think it's worth the struggle. Now nah, I'll just stay in the box because all my friends are in the box and there's comfort in doing the same thing I've done before. I think it's really important to try to do something, if not every day, every week or regularly that you haven't done before. The way I generally do things is I have this, gee, wouldn't it be fun if I did this? And then inevitably a month later, I'll curse myself for saying, why did you decide to do that? 
that was really hard. <laughs> and like, why did you agree? Because it's important to learn and do things you haven't done before. Because if all you do is the stuff you've done before, you never grow. And I think that it's really important to get out of your comfort zone, to go and see something, see a film or a dance performance or a musical performance or a play that is something that is outside of what you normally would do. You'll meet interesting people. You get inspired to do things. The worst thing you can do is to not have your brain be engaged. And by going to do things that you haven't done before, thinking about things you haven't done before, work in different kinds of ways, your brain fires up in a different way. And out of that comes a level of happiness, right? That people who are stuck doing the same thing are not happy. And when you do something you haven't done before, there's happiness in the process and happiness in the product. Flash four. To close out this podcast, we have our flash four segment where we ask all our guests to answer four questions in a flash. Are you ready? Maybe. <laughs> If you had to recommend a resource to our audience, what would it be? Okay. Obviously, I'm very interested in mobile media and filmmaking. Um, there's this email I get every day called Peta Pixel. And the people who run this mostly talk about still photography because that's what they are. But they have a lot of interesting insights into mobile media. And in terms of a daily dose of there's something interesting out there that I didn't know about, that's my go-to place for that. What was the first dance you saw? Okay. I have no idea. I truly have no idea. Because I, I know that when I was very little, my mother took me to ballet performances in Philadelphia. I have no recollection who they were or what it was or anything about it, but I know that's where I first encountered that. Do you think social media has a positive influence on the dance world, yes or no? I think that social media has both a positive and negative effect on everything. And the dance world is part of everything, so yes and no. <laughs> What is your favorite social media platform? So this is, again, reflective of an old person. Old people tend to be on Facebook, and so that's where I am. And I was on Facebook back in the day when you, the only people who could get it were connect, people who were connected to a university, right? I've been on this account for a long time. Yeah, that's what I do. It's And, and again, mostly... I get on there, I wish people happy birthday, and then sometimes I'll post some things that I'm doing. I should do some other posting. I know that I should, but I just don't. I love your honesty. Bart, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Like I was telling you before the recording, I have been waiting for this moment to really pick your brain and talk to you about everything that you've done. It's really inspiring and I personally just want to thank you for what you've done for film in Dallas. I really look up to the work that you've done and I appreciate you taking the time to come on our show. Thank you very much. And you guys have done a really good job organizationally. A lot of people, when they start a festival, are very loosey-goosey about things. You guys take it very seriously and all the things you do very well, very effective and very detailed. It's very strong. I'm very impressed with the work you're doing. Thank you, Bart. How can our listeners stay connected with you and perhaps a little teaser for the book that you're working on? Okay. So no reason to go to TikTok to find me. <laughs> I'm there, but I don't post anything. The best thing, if you're at all, if anything I said here is of interest to you, um, every week I do a newsletter. It comes out some days on, sometimes on Monday, sometimes on Tuesday, sometimes on Wednesday. <laughs> but if you go to our website, videofest.org, and go to the newsletter tab and sign up for it, 
there's always something at, at the bottom of the newsletter has recommendations on things to see in town, but there's always some interesting commentary about something thinking about, and that's always a good way to keep up with what we're doing. The book I'm writing is a book about how to make films with mobile phones. I've submitted the first draft to the publisher, waiting mm-hmm. to get some feedback. Boy, that was a hard thing to do. That was really hard. But and we'll see where it goes from here. So that's where I'm at. I'm doing workshops, like I'm doing one on Sunday in Fort Worth. I've been traveling around doing these little workshops where I bring all of my doodads and filters and microphones and adapters to show all the accessories that people can use. But it's a lot about your podcast. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the podcast is called The Fog of Truth. And it's doc. It's a podcast about documentary films. Frame of Mind will be back next year. The format will be slightly changed. Just had a meeting about that yesterday, but I'm not exactly sure how that's going to play out. But we will be strong and back again. Uh, we have some programs coming up for our festival. There's the 48 hour video race that we're doing with the. Pegasus Film Festival people, and then we have the North Texas University's Film Festival in the first week in April. And it seems to me we're doing something else, but I can't remember at the moment. Thanks again, Bart, for coming on our show. The Act Behind the Screen podcast is produced by Novox Dance, an art service organization that creates, collaborates, and discusses art with artists and the public. Dance Behind the Screen podcast is co-hosted by Azaria Hogans, Raina Mondragon, Marthea Nygaard, and Yejin Choi, with sound designed by Daniel Rosas. Thanks for taking your time to tune into Dance Behind the Screen, a bi-monthly interview series where we go behind the screen to question process, product, and social media. Be sure to follow us on social media at KNOW Box Dance. See you next time and don't forget to say no to the box.